Right, hello and welcome. Get started here in just a second. Let everybody log in. All right, so um, welcome to New York Wines Online. Uh, this is our final episode of a three-part series and we are exploring New York State, the people, the regions, and the wines. Um, and in this third episode, we've got a lot to cover. We have two parts to this session uh, with a different panel of winemakers for each. Um, and we'll be looking at how and why New York is boldly coming into its own, using its cool climate and unique grape growing and winemaking practices to produce distinctive styles of wine. So for those of you who are tasting along with us, uh, we would like to thank our partners, Master the World, for putting together the tasting kits for us and to Cabot Cheese for providing a nice selection of uh, local cheeses that you might want to try these wines with following the session. So a few housekeeping notes. There are two communication methods available to participants. Uh, we've got the chat section and a Q&A section. The chat section is an or informal way for you to communicate with other participants. And the Q&A section is where we'd like you to submit your questions uh, to be answered during the webinar. Uh, the session will also be recorded and you will receive um, a copy of the recording following the session. So our host today is Kelly White. And uh, Kelly is a wine writer, author of the critically acclaimed book, Napa Valley Then and Now. Previously, she worked as a sommelier in New York City and California and now serves as director of education for the Wine Center at Meadowood in Napa Valley. Uh, so a recording, um, as I mentioned, will be sent to you in the next couple of days and will be posted to our YouTube channel. And I will just hand it over to Kelly here and she'll take it away. Thank you, uh, Katie. I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, I'm excited to be talking about these wines with um, such a wonderful panel. Uh, as Katie mentioned, we have a lot of ground to cover in a short amount of time. So uh, I want to, you know, ask everyone's um, patience as we we keep things brief. Um, one thing that we decided not to do in this particular webinar was to take a minute and do an overview of the different wine growing regions of New York State. Because this is the third in a series of webinars, um, and there are you can refer to the other webinars um, for that information, but the individual um, winery representatives here today will of course be um, touching upon some of the unique characteristics and challenges of their regions. Um, but just in the best interest of getting giving everybody their, their fair due and uh, time at the mic to talk about their wines, we're just going to kind of skip that part. So I'm going to um, just address the structure of this panel. As Katie intimated, we've broken it up into, into two kind of mini panels. Um, so the first flight of three wines in these uh, wineries and these panelists are kind of roughly um, the way I've sort of fleshed this out is to be, you know, the focusing on more of the classic varieties and sort of different approaches to these classic varieties. And so each of these wines has a kind of unique story to tell, um, but definitely has some, I would say, comfort and familiarity for consumers. The second flight is a little bit more um, unusual, I think, uh, and we'll be using the second flight to talk more about kind of uh, unexpected winemaking practices and uh, approaches to farming as well. So thank you everyone again um, for coming. And then if you throw up questions and answers, we're going to bring all the panelists back at the end to address um, all your questions. But if something particularly salient pops up, Katie will let me know and we can address it midstream. Uh, but let's go ahead and jump right in with Ben at Osmote. Um, ben, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, your corner of the world, uh, your winery, and then of course the, the wine that we have in front of us. I think you're on mute, Ben. Hey there. Thank you everyone for the opportunity. Great to be with you. I am Ben Riccardi, the owner the winemaker for Osmo Winery. I'm located on Seneca Lake. Um, this is the deepest lake in the Finger Lakes. And the um, wine that you have, the 2021 Chardonnay Seneca Lake, um, obviously comes from vineyards on actually the east shore of uh, this lake. So this being the, 
the deepest lake and my fruit sourcing being on the east side, um, steep hillside vineyards, which appreciate a lot of warm afternoon sun and in their steepness um, and with the um, glacial alluvial um, gravel soils that they have. These I feel of, of um, the, the vineyards from which I buy, these are the sites which uh, give me the, the greatest concentration, the smallest berries, the most um, potential for complexity and an ability to uh, marry to oak. So the wine in your glass is an oak fermented and aged um, Chardonnay. Um, <clears throat> Osmo means to move naturally towards balance. It's meant to be an ode to the lakes and the way they um, balance our, our, our weather. But it, it's also an allusion to what I'm doing in the winery and maybe what makes this wine uh, unique. So that means I, I believe very strongly in uh, natural yeast, um, you know, vineyard yeast fermentations, just letting the wine kind of make itself. Um, and I that's a, tends to be a, a pretty long and, and slow fermentation, but um, I feel it drives complexity and it really helps um, to integrate oak into the wine. And then uh, further to help the integration, uh, I'm, I'm using rather large uh, barrels, uh, 400 liter barrels. It's French oak. There's a good amount of uh, new French oak on these. Uh, I think you, you see that in some of the, the, the tropical notes, some of the um, sweet spice, um, maybe hazelnut uh, aromas, things of this nature. But also, um, you know, the, 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 the oak and the large size of the oak uh, and, you know, a very lazy um, fermentation. I, I hope that it helps bring kind of a reductive edge, um, which you might see as that, um, you know, a flinty struck match sort of just a, a slight, you know, um, hint in, in the back. Um, this, this wine's from the 21 vintage, very cool, high acid vintage. And that led me to um, think kind of like uh, Muscadet and, and take some, some lessons that I, I learned in, in New Zealand, um, kind of studying like Kumia River and such. So there's a lot of extra um, lees work trying to develop uh, texture with an otherwise very um, tight kind of lean Chardonnay. So enjoy everyone. And if you have any questions, I am more than happy to answer them. Ben, I think it's it's fair to say that one of the main challenges of grape growing, vinifera growing in the Finger Lakes is the is the cold temperature. So, Katie, can we go back to that map for a second? Um, that shows where this fruit is coming from. So, in case it just wasn't clear to the people listening, my understanding, and Ben, please correct me if I'm wrong, that the it's the the southeast section of uh, Seneca Lake is one of the warmer places um, to grow grapes in the Finger Lakes. Is is that accurate? Yeah, historically that's been called um, the Banana Belt, and mm -hmm. there's a there's a road here called uh, Peach Orchard Road, which um, is a name that kind of goes back to the uh, Haudenosaunee, um, what the French called the the Iroquois um, Native Americans. They actually cultivated peaches out here, recognizing that this was kind of a warmer spot, and you know that's that's the combination of. Lake Erie in Ontario above us and, and to our west kind of um, tamping down the cold from Canada, but then further further still those cold, the, those that cold air is, is moving uh, uh, across our, our lake before it's hitting this side of the lake. And, and then not to mention, you know, again, we, we are sloped towards afternoon, warmer. West know, facing. Mm -hmm. So I'm, inter I'm interested to know, so you, you mentioned that you purchased the fruit for this wine. Did you have a, uh, an idea of Chardonnay in your mind and then sought out a fruit source from a, a, an area that you knew would sort of support your vision? Or did you start out with the fruit and then decide, how do I approach this in the cellar uh, in order to create the wine that, that I want to make? I've always been really very um, Chardonnay motivated. It was the first wine I made. Um, 
since 2014. And um, I have a, a selection of, I'm, I'm kind of like a, a negociant. I have 30 acres here in that sweet spot that you've been alluding to, um, or maybe kind of just south of the sweet spot. It's questionable if maybe I'm, I'm actually a cooler site, even though I'm on the, uh, the east shore. Um, alas, um, this is purchased through, I have a couple of cuvées. I also make a Cuga Lake um, Chardonnay fruit from the west side morning sun, flatter vineyard site, um, and a much more uh, clay heavy soil, bigger berries, just keep it simple, very fruit forward. But again, these are my hillside sites um, on the warm side and good gravel drainage in the soil, kind of a conflux of things where, you know, I get just a little bit more concentration in those berries. And um, yeah, et, et voila. I like that you use the larger oak format so as to not overwhelm sort of the delicate fruit profile with you know, it, I think it makes for a nice um, oak impression that isn't dominant. Thank you. I'm glad you, I'm glad you like that. You know, that was something I was first introduced to. Um, I saw these large barrels while I was working in New Zealand in Hawke's Bay, and we were marrying them to one of the coolest uh, Chardonnay sites that we worked with, the Kidnapper's Cliff Vineyard, um, right on the shore there. And um yeah, I, I, I learned a really valuable lesson and um, it was a nice way to, to marry oak. And I've um, felt for a while that, um, you know, that this, this area shied away from oak and I really wanted to embrace it. Um, Great. Patricia, I did not actually work at Kumia River. I worked for uh, Craggy Range, drank a good deal of Kumia River and then read about some of their techniques in a great book, um, Taming the Screw by uh, Tyson Stelzer. Oh, wonderful. Well, um, let's move on to Edward at Glenora, and then uh, we'll bring Ben back at the end of the webinar for any more questions. Um, Edward, why don't you give us a little overview of Glenora and, and the wine that we have in front of us? Absolutely, Kelly, thank you. Uh, well, I'm delighted to be here and sharing this wine with everyone. Uh, so Glenora is one of the oldest uh, wineries on Seneca Lake, uh, started back in 1976. So they've got quite a good long history. Uh, and myself have only been there for about two years um, and took over for their longtime winemaker in June of 21. So this 21 Gewurz was my first vintage. Um, you know, at Glenora, we make a, a wide range of wines. Um, a little bit of many things. Gewurz is definitely a uh, standard for us. This fruit was from Glenora Farms, which surprisingly is not owned by Glenora Winery, but is uh, owned by a grower, but the vineyard is right across the road from us. So I can look out uh, from the cellar and see the Gewurz Treminer uh, just a stone's throw away. Um, you know, I think it's difficult to talk about uh, winemaking in the Finger Lakes and winemaking on the edge without talking about vintage variability. And as winemakers in this region, it's something that we both have to manage and also embrace. So, you know, we could see the, the 21 vintage throughout the growing season was clearly going to be a cooler and somewhat wetter vintage. So, you know, we had to start thinking about what we were going to do with these wines, um, you know, should that continue, which it, it did throughout the season. So this Gewürztraminer was, uh, I wouldn't say it was picked early. I, I picked this on October 4th, which is, uh, I think, a pretty normal time uh, for Gewürztraminer. We were able to let it hang uh, just long enough, I think, to get some nice flavor development. But the wine itself is going to be delicate um, and, you know, for a Gewürztraminer especially, higher acid. Um, and, you know, the aromatics aren't so much in the kind of rosy potpourri category for me. Um, they're a little bit more delicate floral, a little bit um, of uh, like a tangerine and apricot in there as well. 
Um, you might notice that there is 10% azigarebe in there. Uh, that fruit was actually from Knapp Winery over on Cayuga Lake. And uh, that was the first fruit I picked this year. And I had never been able to play around with it either, but I found uh, I did some blending trials and really liked what it did with just a 10% add to the uh, Gewürztraminer, just kind of gave it a little bit of uh, extra fruit on the nose. Um, so this uh, wine was, you know, I can't say I did anything dramatic with this wine, but we did give it about 24 hour skin contact uh, when we picked it, try to extract some of the terpenes from the skins and some of their aroma precursors. Um, I did inoculate this with a, a yeast called X5 from Lafort. I do like playing around with native ferments, um, but for me, and it, it speaks to the kind of the flexibility we need to have in these areas, um, it depends on the vintage and how the fruit looks. You know, sometimes I'm happy to let the native uh, microflora take over, and sometimes I want to, um, you know, be safe and uh, inoculate with the yeast that I, I know the characteristics of. Um, so let's see, this one was a relatively slow ferment, um, a few weeks, and then, uh, yeah, you know, generally keep things pretty cool in the cellar. I do like to have, you know, slower paced, cooler ferments to try to retain and develop as much aromatic, aromatics as possible. And um, yeah, I mean, it was a vintage in 21 where you had to kind of embrace, I think, restraint and embrace the, the fruit as it was. Um, you know, we can do a lot in the cellar and it's important for us to have a toolkit as winemakers. But um, particularly in these lighter vintages, too much manipulation and uh, intervention starts to show through in the wine. And so, you know, we have to um, you know, take, the, take what the vintage can give us and try to enjoy the product from that. I'm interested um, because I've had a number of Gewürztraminers from the Finger Lakes area, and I understand that in the kind of vinifera suite, it makes a lot of sense there for the climate and its relative cold hardiness. Um, but I've tasted a range of residual sugars. I was wondering if you could speak specifically to the role of residual sugar in balancing vintage variation and the notoriously high acids from the region. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the residual sugar can be a great tool for us to add a little bit, um, you know, a little bit higher residual sugar can bring out some more uh, fruit uh, flavors and aromatics. Um, it can change the texture, make it a little bit softer, as you mentioned, help balance the acidity. Uh, Gewürztraminer is, is a bit of a, a funny one. Um, it uh, unfortunately is not the most cold hardy uh, varietal. Um, so we tend to see uh, quite a bit of winter injury in the Gewürztraminer. Um, for example, I didn't uh, make a 2022 Gewürztraminer because the January of 22 was such a cold month that uh, it was very difficult to get uh, fruit and, and my vineyards uh, just didn't have enough on them to, to make. Um, and then Gewürztraminer also tends to lose acid relatively quickly towards the end of the season in a, in a warmer, more normal year. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, the residual sugar is, as I said, it's important for us to have uh, a toolkit and kind of know what we can do for the wine. So this is um, relatively low residual sugar. I think this is um, about 10 grams per liter. Uh, so, you know, it's not by any means a dry wine, but I think it still drinks relatively dry because the vintage was a higher acid year for sure. And is that, is, are you, when you're making this wine every year, uh, other than 2022, my apologies, um, but when you're making this wine generally, are you aiming for the similar, this level of residual sugar, or are you responding in real time to the vintage and the framing of the wine? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I do have kind of um, a range for this style of Gewürz. I mean, we make a drier style of Gewürz as our house style. Now, within that kind of bracket I'm happy to play around say between you know uh, five grams to 15 grams per liter depending on the vintage so there is a a style that I am targeting but within that uh, style I'm, I'm happy to be flexible and uh, adjust based on the vintage 
Interesting. So there's, there seems to be a lot of um, curiosity about the, the Sigarebe. Um, and so could you maybe um, dwell on that a little bit? Specifically, what does it add to the blend? Someone's asking if it adds freshness. Um, what does it add aromatically? Yeah, certainly. Um, so the, the Sigarebe is, a, it is an unusual one. I think Nap is probably the only or one of the very few places that are, are growing it. They planted an experimental block, uh, I believe back in 2005. So it's a, it's a small block on their vineyard and it is a, um, a crossbreed uh, between two viniferous species. Um, and it, so it has some characteristics similar to Gewurz. It has some of the floral notes, but for this vintage, um, I mainly added it for the aromatics. I thought it gave an extra little punch of some uh, of some fruit to this. As I said, I knew I wasn't really going to get like the the really intense rose or even you know on the palate the really intense kind of oily uh, feeling that some Gewurzes can give from this vintage. So um, in uh, playing around with with blends in the cellar, I felt that that ten percent just lifted the aromatics and gave it a little bit more fruit that I liked. Okay, um, I you know in preparation for this because I don't have a lot of experience with this variety, right. I've got my handy dandy wine grapes out, and uh, the primary characteristic this book lists are it's it's you know sort of muscat scented um, characteristics. So aromatic, and of course you know it is worth pointing out that this is vinifera. Um, so yeah. um, kind of interesting. Anyway, um, very fun. Edward, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much. Happy to be here. All right, let's move on to um, to Phil at Montezuma. Um, Phil, tell us a little bit about this wine and your winery. Hi, thanks, Kelly. Um, my name is Phil Plummer. I'm the head winemaker uh, for Montezuma Winery. We're located in Seneca Falls on the north end of Cayuga Lake. Um, and this wine is part of a new series that we launched back in uh, 2020 called our Velour series. Velour is the French word for thief. And the idea here is that we're, we're stealing ideas from all over the world and, and seeing what they look like when we scale them to the fruit that we're working with here. Um, this wine is actually not a, a Finger Lakes wine. It was sourced. If you look at the map there, if you want to leave it up for a second, um, just uh, northwest of, of where you see the dot for the winery, there's a bay on Lake Ontario, Sodus Bay, and that's where this fruit was grown. Um, and, and we had been working with farms up there for, for several years, and one of the things that we learned is, is that they're on a totally different ripening pattern than the Finger Lakes. So uh, 10 to 14 days behind, and it made it kind of a struggle sometimes with, with dry reds to get them to, to the right concentration and complexity that we wanted. Um, Limburger in particular, we had a tough time getting them to finish. Uh, they kind of disappeared after the, the mid-palate impact that you taste. So we, we tried a bunch of different things to, to make interesting chillable red wine with this. And uh, it occurred to us that one thing we hadn't tried was co-fermentation. And uh, just a, a few rows over in that vineyard was some Gruner Veltliner that was coming into production. And, and we didn't have a, a a home for it. This was a farm that we contracted to buy everything, everything they could grow. So we didn't have a home for the Gruner and it made sense to, to try it coat roti style. So we brought it in. Uh, it ripened about a week ahead of the Lemberger. We put the, the fermentation bins up on our pallet scale and crushed 300 pounds into each of them and, and then let them, uh, we inoculated them, let them start fermenting. And when the, the Lemberger was harvested a week later, we just crushed it on top of the, the active fermentations. So we, we let it take off and take over. Um, Post-pressing after about 14 days, uh, this was all in neutral oak for, for somewhere around five, six months before we pulled it and bottled it. Just real light, low alcohol, um, just super fresh. And I think that the Gruner reinforces all the fun secondary aromatics and flavors that we like out of Lemberger. So that pepper thing that's, that's there gets uh, even stronger with Gruner behind it. And then we can put some, some cool citrusy edges on it as well. Interesting, interesting. Um, I'm sure that probably um, everyone in the audience knows, but if you don't, uh, Limburger is kind of another name for Blaufränkisch, and that's a big, um, important red grape uh, in this particular area. Um, I think the the co-ferment thing is really interesting. This is a very fun wine um, to me. Could you speak a little bit about the difference between 
co-fermenting versus just blending. What are you getting out of a co-ferment that you don't necessarily get just by adding finished Gruner to this wine? So I think um, the thing that was really attractive to us about Gruner as a variety for co-fermentation is the, the tannin that it brings with it. Gruner is a really super phenolic white and, and um, the Lemberger we were, we were getting from this farm was kind of lacking that backbone. And when, when you crush a grape and, and everything starts interacting, if you don't have a good tannin source right there, sometimes they can be scavenged away by the proteins that you're releasing into your, into your uh, must. So it was important for us to kind of set up a backbone early and then, then have that as scaffolding to build on when it was time to get the Lemberger in. Um, and, and I think it's more harmonious this way too. I, I think you, you can kind of massage the, the Lemberger into what you want it to be by, by doing it this way. And it, it feels a lot more integrated um, and intentional. Is your intention also that this wine be served with a little bit of a chill? I think so. I think it, it benefits from it. Um, it's a, a softer, easier drinking red, but I think it, it proves that that style doesn't have to be simple. Um, we're, we're getting a lot of complexity out of this one, um, even after a chill. I mean, I think it's very interesting the way that this pulls lessons from Cote Roti, although, and I don't mean this with any disrespect, that it doesn't, you know, it's not exactly redolent of Cote Roti. It's its own animal. And so are you finding that you're taking these lessons from other places because you're trying to create something that's more comfortable for consumers, or you're just sort of problem solving for the limitations of climate or the challenges of your area? Uh, I think more of it has to do that with, that personally, I, I'm novelty obsessed. I, I like to try things I've never tried before. Um, and this always, like when I was getting into the wine industry and the Finger Lakes, it was really um, fashionable to refer to Lemberger as like cool climate Syrah. So that kind of put a light bulb in my brain, like, okay, so what, what piece do you have growing with Lemberger all over the world? And, and it happens to be right in this vineyard. So it made sense to give it a try, um, but I just, yeah, I, I don't know. It was it was more of a well, they do it, so let's try it. It's it's not it's not something that that is terrible when they try it out. So let's see what happens when we do it with with the pieces that we have. And, and I think it worked. I, I agree with you a hundred percent. It's not it's not coat roti. And, and if you do, <laughs> It didn't do any of the things that I expected. You know, Coat Roti, when they make those Syrahs, they're that like electric purple and the color change, like the color shifts and, and it really reinforces that Syrah and adds some freshness there. But this, this still drinks cool climate and light and fresh. Um, it just pushed in a totally different direction than I expected, but I, I was along for the ride. It's also interesting, I think, to be adding a white grape, uh, but instead of adding kind of a counterbalancing or an opposite uh, for opposite reasons, like Viognier is sort of opposite to Syrah in a lot of ways, you're adding it as a reinforcing um, agent to Lemberger's existing characteristics is kind of interesting. Um, it's cool wine. Um, thank, thank you. Um, so we're at already over the halfway mark, which is just devastating. We should do this all day. So we're going to, um, Katie and, and Amanda and team are going to shuffle our, um, panelists here and we'll get the next three up on screen. Uh, but thank you guys very much for really fun wines, really well-made, beautiful wines. Um, and we're excited about the next round. So We've got Christopher Tracy from Channing Daughters, Ben Stamp from Lakewood, and Amy Opiso from Lieb uh, joining us um, with three really um, tasty wines to show off. So um, like I said, this um, particular flight is looking at um, just wines that are maybe a little bit more um, different from a consumer um, comfort or uh Exist, pre-existing European model sort of standpoint. And I'm really excited um, to start off with this Channing Daughters uh, pet nat. Um, you know, as a, as a former New Yorker, I think my very first pet nat was Channing Daughters. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, they're still top of the heap. And so uh, Christopher 
probably considered the world's foremost expert in the creation of pet net. I don't know, Christopher, you tell me, you tell me if I'm wrong, but um, if you're up here um, on, on the um, panel already, if you're set to the right settings on Zoom, why don't you take us away and tell us a little bit about how you got kind of started on this whole um, pet net ride. Um, I can't see myself, but that doesn't really matter. Oh, here we go. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm definitely not the expert. I'm just a student, <laughs> humble, <laughs> constantly learning student. But we did give you a big bottle of it because it's so delicious. We figured you guys would need it all for the rest of this and into your evening or your afternoon or whatever it may be. So, um, Yes, I'm Christopher Tracy. I am the winemaker at Channing Daughters Winery uh, in Bridgehampton on the South Fork in Long Island. And thank you, Kelly, for having me and us and uh, Katie and the New York Wine and Grape Foundation for doing this stuff. It's awesome. Um, so, yeah, we like to push the envelope of what's possible in our region, in our vineyards and in our cellars. And uh, we do lots of different, fun, delicious um, things at Channing Daughters. Uh, we make lots of white wines and red wines, skin fermented white wines, or what people like to call orange wines, uh, a beautiful, expressive, delicious rosé program, um, and a sparkling program where we make uh, Petiant Natural or Method Ancestral um, sparklers. This happens to be the 2019 Tokai Friulano from the Silvanus Vineyard, a three acre plot within our um, Sylvanus Vineyard on our uh, estate in Bridgehampton. We have about 28 acres of vines um, on the property and we work with some growing partners on the North Fork as well. Um, we started making pet gnats back in 2013 because our region um, makes world-class sparkling wines um, in uh, traditional method um, sparkling wines. Um, people like Eric Fry at Lens and uh, Roman Roth at Wolfer and uh, Gilles at Sparkling Point and have, have proven that they're, they're just awesome. But, you know, they take a lot of time and they take a lot of money and they take a lot of space. And we wanted to make sparkling wines and we figured why not make uh, Pet Nats or Method Ancestral um, wines. Uh, we like to look to the past a lot, um, way back. And it's something that's been done for, for you know, a, quite a long time. Um, and uh, they're appropriate for our region. So hand harvested grapes, uh, Tokai Friulana, we hand pick the grapes in the little 30 pound baskets, bring them up to the press, put them in basket by basket, very uh, light pressing to about 1.7 atmospheres, um, settle the juice out in the stainless steel tank, go in the next day through the top and take out the clearest juice for the pet gnats that we put into another stainless steel tank at that point and let ferment ambiently or wild or spontaneously or whatever your favorite word of the moment describing that process is. So uh, wild or ambient ferment, we monitor that ferment. Uh, Tindall gets down to an appropriate sugar level that we uh, can bottle at that point. And then by bottling the wine before it finishes its fermentation, uh, the CO2 is trapped in solution under the crown cap and uh, dissolves into the wine and creates a sparkling wine. Thus, we have the Method Ancestral or Petion Natural wines. Um, they're just delicious. They're fun. They're expressive. Uh, they smell good. They taste good. There's a lot of room for them at the table from brunch through dinner. Um, so we like we like it. And we love Tokai. Uh, Tokai is a white uh, grape that obviously originated in Northeast Italy, um, in Friuli, Venezia, Giulia, um, and we love it here. We grow a lot of other grapes besides the wonderful Merlot and Chardonnay that our region was founded on. Um, we in particular have done that because uh, our founder and my partner, Larry Perrine, was instrumental in starting the research vineyard for the Cornell, uh, the Cornell Cooperative Research Vineyard over in Riverhead. So uh, with his work there in the 80s and then Alice Wise's continuing work there for our community and our industry, we knew the grapes like Topai Friulano, Lagrine, um, Muscat, uh, Rafosco, uh, Dornfelder, Blaufrankish would work. And that's why we've planted these grapes, you know, from, well, this vineyard went in in 99. 
Um, so when we make still wines from it, we make sparkling wines from it. We use it as a blend in symphonic white wines. So we really like to play with Tokai. So cheers, I hope you guys like the wine. Cheers, the wine is delicious. Um, I'm interesting, interested if you could talk for a little bit about the South Fork in particular, because my understanding is there really isn't a lot of viticulture on the South Fork since there's such a high um, competition from a real estate, um, other, you know, other purposes for the real estate. How would you, if you can, um, kind of differentiate the South Fork from the North Fork um, for the people watching? So, um, yeah, there are only three commercial wineries on the South Fork, us, Wolfer, and Duck Walk. Um, there are some other vineyards. Um, and it's crazy because there's more plantable agricultural land on the South Fork than there is on the North Fork when, when you look at it. There's, but the land was bought up here and the real estate competition has been huge for more than half a century. Um, obviously, because people wanted to come out here and be near the ocean. So, you know, our, our, we're only two and a half miles from the Atlantic Ocean and then uh, the, bay, the bays are on the other side of us. And so, um, you know, the differences uh, between like Channing Daughters and Lee that you see there are as great as the differences between like Riverhead and Greenport. Um, but there are differences uh, between the South Fork and the North Fork. We do get a bit more of an Atlantic influence because we're the buffer for it right there. Like I said, we're only about two and a half miles from the ocean, which makes for my fishing great. Um, though it's great on the North Fork too. Um, but so maybe one to two degrees cooler, maybe one to five days difference in bud break. Um, the soils are different. We have three, we're loam soils out here, part of the same, um, you know, glacial event that created the Finger Lakes 10,000 plus years ago, you know, ended here. Um, and so they're loam soils with gravelly, sandy subsoils. And there's three different series of loam. There's Bridgehampton loam, um, Riverhead series and Haven series loams. And the Bridgehampton loam where we are has a, a little bit thicker um, topsoil, a little bit more water holding capacity. You know, so there are, are differences. Um, that's, well, there are some specific ones. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we'll come back to you again with some Q&A at the end of the, at the webinar, but let's move on to Amy at Lieb right now. Um, Amy, thank you for joining us. I know you were a last minute substitution. We really appreciate you um, joining us today. So why don't you tell us a little bit about Lieb, um, about yourself and about this wine? Sure. Um, so I'll start by saying you can all tell I'm not Russell Hearn. Uh, he was supposed to be with us today. He is um, our winemaker um, and he has been our winemaker from uh, the very beginning. So I was hoping that he could be here today. Unfortunately, he's dealing with a family thing. Um, but why, why I was really hoping he was gonna be here today, I was gonna actually be um, attending is because I know he's particularly excited um, about this wine and it's not one that we normally um, present uh, in panels like this because we're typically always talking about our Pinot Blanc, which is our sort of signature wine and one that gets the most recognition. Um, but my name is Amy. I am the general manager at Lieb Cellars, and um, I've been the general manager here now, which is crazy. Christopher, you may not remember this, but I came and tasted at Channing Daughters almost like eight years ago now. Um, and I've been the winemaker, I've been the, uh, the GM at Lieb Cellars for, for a decade now. So oh. I have, yeah, <laughs> it was actually one of my most um, memorable wine tasting experiences um, at Channing Daughter. So I all, I encourage you guys to, to go there and taste with Christopher if you ever can. But I've been at Lieb now for 10 years. Russell, as I said, has been with Lieb um, for 30 years. Um, Lieb was established in 1982 when Mark Lieb, our original owner, purchased our Pinot Blanc vineyard right down the street. Um, and the Long Island, there's a lot of sort of anniversaries going on. 10 years for me, 30 years for Russell at Lieb, and 50 years for Long at the Long Island wine uh, country. So um, it's pretty exciting what's gone on in those, in those 50 years. And um, something that's exciting for us at Lieb Cellars is uh, what we're now doing with this wine and this new um, nine acre vineyard that we are farming. So even though Lieb has a pretty long history, um, Ter this, is a 20, this is our 2020 estate, Teraldigo Lagrine. Our first vintage of this was actually 2019. So this was only um, the second vintage of this wine that Russell made. And um, we started making it in 2019 when we took over um, 
farming and leased a small nine acre vineyard in Southold, about five miles um, away from our state vineyard where I am right now in Kutchog. So at that vineyard, there is about 3%, to, uh, three acres, I'm sorry, of Terraldigo and three acres of Lagrine. Obviously, um, lesser known uh, varietals, less popular varietals here. I think, uh, Christopher, do you guys have some Lagrine planted? I don't know if there are any other, there's any other Terraldigo planted. We, we, yeah, we have Terraldigo planted too. We, we planted Terraldigo, interplanted Terraldigo and Blaufrankish in the Sculpture Garden Vineyard way back before before Southhold planted that vineyard and we planted because I remember Regan coming to ask about it and talk about it and um and we planted Lagrine as well we have Lagrine on that but there's nobody else besides, besides us and now you guys awesome. um that have that have those varieties and we don't have any we have Lagrine that we make as Lagrine obviously as a red wine and sometimes as a rosé but the Tiraldigo is just part of, of a field blend and we don't have enough to make Fine. as a as, as a variety Got it. So we have, um, you know, three acres of each in that vineyard. And I believe the reason why um, Russell was drawn to it um, is first and foremost, because he likes Northern Italian um, wines. If you ask him what's in his cellar at home, he would say that it's, it's mostly Italian uh, wines, which is interesting because he is Australian and he's made wine in um, Australia, New Zealand, France, California, and now um, the U.S. But he is a uh, his favorite um, uh, uh, winemaking country is Italy. And so I think he was, you know, interested in these two varietals for, for uh, two reasons. One, because he's liked wine made in um, Alto, Trentino, Alto Adige, that the region where these wine, uh, varietals originated. Um, and because he was looking for, I think, a challenge as we all do you know, as a, as a lot of the winemakers do when he get he got into sort of, I think, a rhythm with our Bordeaux varietals and the other varietals that we have planted. And, and he was looking to sort of do something different and try to make, you know, um, good wine out of these varietals that uh, he's, he's drank and he's loved. So um, this wine is 66% Terraldigo, 34% Le Grine. Um, and what he tells me sort of he gets out of uh, blending them. And the reason that we are blending them is because Teraldigo is giving us a lot of color, um, tannin and spice. And then from the Lagrine, you get a lot of those red um, cherry fruits and then also brightness and acidity. So I think that, um, you know, there's real there's sort of a real nice balance going on. And I think when we tried, you know, the 2019 as a team originally, um, Russell sort of, we were tasting and he presented to us, what was striking to us was, um, you know, first and foremost, the color on it. It's definitely our, our darkest red wine that we're making. Um, but then if you, you know, if you get past the color and you taste the wine, I think it's, um, you know, more sort of um, balanced and fresher than you would expect on, on the palate. Um, and I know that that Russell, you know, it, it was a little bit of an experiment for him to start farming this vineyard um, and making this wine, but I, I, I can tell from him that he likes it, he's excited by it, um, he drinks it. And I believe that he um, uh, thinks that these varieties are well suited to our area uh, because uh, you know, they're both early ripeners. Um, the uh, tannin that's developed when, when we're growing these, even in a short period of time, um, is, is soft. And the wine doesn't need that much oak. So in a vintage like 2020, Christopher, you'll remember, it was sort of, we call it the vintage of extremes. It was like really um, uh, warm and dry and perfect in the beginning of the vintage. And then in late October, there was like three weeks straight of rain. Um, and we were able to pick Teraldigo and Lagrine um, and make a, a fully ripe balanced wine uh, prior to those rains in early October. So we were picking these, these grapes even before we're picking Merlot. Do you think it's, it's fair to say that the ability to blend these two grapes together gives you some flexibility to respond to more extreme vintages like 2020? Yes, I think so. I mean, um, Russell, I, I, I think is, you know, he's going to adjust up sort of 
the Taraldigo um, or Lagrine each vintage. And um, this, you know, for the, the 2019 was actually slightly more Taraldigo. And then he plussed that down with the 2020. And I think we're going to learn as we continue to farm these grapes. Um, we'll learn. I know he said that it was challenging in the beginning because um, the the vines were both more vigorous than what he was expecting. So we did have to make some adjustments in the vineyard in terms of um, pruning and uh, shoot thinning. But I do think that he is happy to have um, both of these grapes, which can uh, balance each other out. Because I think if we were just making uh, Teraldigo, it might be, you know, there might just be a little bit, it might be a little too sharp. I think Teraldigo can, can kind of come across um, as a little bit, a little bit sour, a little bit too spicy, but we have the Lebrine to balance that out with some like really nice red fruits. Thank you, Amy. I think it's a fun wine. Um, people seem to be enjoying it. I mean, one of the things that I love most about New York wine is the playfulness and the creativity. I think, you know, there's, it's, it's wonderful and exciting and refreshing and engaging um, to see so many different in, people pulling from so many different areas of inspiration rather yeah. than trying to collectively tie yourself into a knot to emulate a particularly successful historic model. So, um, so bravo to, to you both. Um, let's move on, uh, to, to Ben, um, uh, at Lakewood and to our final line for the flight, um, which I think is this venial is, is kind of exciting and we takes us right back to the Finger Lakes. Great. Thank you very much, Kelly. Um, and thank you, everyone else. These wines, uh, I was kind of at first thinking, man, Vignol in this lineup might be a real outlier. Um, but after tasting these wines, they're all so tasty and they're so unique in their own way um, that I think the Vignol as a kind of a sweet, almost dessert style here really fits in at the end of this lineup. And I hope you guys enjoy it. Um, we're down at the south end of Seneca Lake here in the Finger Lakes, deepest of the Finger Lakes, and we're actually right across Seneca Lake from, um, from Ben Riccardi's vineyard, uh, and tasting room. So we can, we can pretty much, actually, we can see his, uh, his little plot from where we are and he can see us as well. So, uh, as the crow flies just a couple miles, um, but of course you can't get there from here. You got to go around like everything in the Finger Lakes. So, um, we have uh, we have a vignole here for you guys to try today. It's uh, it's definitely an interesting wine with an interesting history that is kind of still being written to a certain extent because nobody at this point is quite sure where it came from. Originally, um, vignole as a hybrid variety was thought to have been hybridized by a French grape grape breeder named J.F. Ravat uh, back in like 1930 or in the 20s at some point. Um, and apparently imported to America in 1949. Um, but it has been known in the Finger Lakes at least since as early as 1970 as Vignole. Um, and it was thought to be the same thing as Ravat 51. And it has actually been, um, they've done some genetic testing. Uh, the initial Ravat 51, they thought was, uh, had, had two main parent varieties, which was um, uh, Les Souvereaux, which is a Cybel clone, uh, 6905 and then Pinot de Corton, which is a, a clone of Pinot that they used a lot for, for cloning, uh, and for, for breeding different hybrid varieties back in France, um, where JF Ravat was from, but, uh, recent genetic testing has shown that the vignole that we call vignole here in the Finger Lakes and grow quite a bit of, um, does not actually share parentage with either of those varieties. Therefore, we have something that we don't really know what it is or where it came from, but it grows quite well here in the Finger Lakes, and that's what you're tasting right now. Ours was planted in the early 70s, and uh, it was planted right here next to what is now our winery and tasting room. Of course, those were not in the ground at the time, uh, but my grandfather planted these vines, and he was a pioneer of, of uh, viticulture here on Seneca Lake and in the Finger Lakes, and, and really kind of uh, got his hands dirty every day out in the vineyards, learning how to grow hybrids and uh, viniferas here in the 70s and 80s. So um, it's an interesting variety in its own right. It definitely uh, is more of a concentrated hybrid that drinks kind of more like a vinifera, doesn't have a lot of real in-your-face hybrid characteristics. Um, 
but it tends to get quite ripe and keep high acid. Uh, but we can also make a nice balanced sweet wine because it, it brings in pretty high, um, uh, pretty high sugar as well. So it's not uncommon for us to pick this between 25 and 26 degrees bricks, which is uh, pretty tremendously ripe. And usually that's coming in um, sometime around the third week of September, sometimes the fourth week of September here. Uh, depending on the vintage. 2021 was a pretty challenging vintage here in the Finger Lakes, as Ed kind of alluded to earlier. And so uh, we were out in the vineyards uh, quite often. Um, we went through this vineyard every week for about a month, and we would drop any fruit that showed any signs of infection, which in this particular vineyard is challenging. Uh, Vignole has really small berries and tight clusters, and they are pretty prone to developing botrytis, which of course you guys may know as noble rot. Um, and botrytis scenario uh, sets in and, and if it remains dry, you can make a really nice concentrated wine with those honeyed and earthy characteristics that, that noble rot gives you. But if it stays wet, then uh, that can develop into other, other levels of uh, uh, rot and infection that we just don't tolerate in the cellar. So we were out there a lot looking for those and cutting them off, which is of course pretty heartbreaking, but I think we were really able to save the crop um, through all that, through all that heartbreak and, and made a pretty nice wine here uh, out of that. So um, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting wine and um, it's one that, that is always like right there off the back of our press deck. So we're keeping a really close eye on it because it can turn the corner quickly. Um, but it's, uh, it's definitely got a, a richer texture and it makes a nice kind of sweeter dessert style wine. Um, but you know, these, these hybrid varieties, um, they have an interesting history here in the Finger Lakes. Uh, you know, there's a lot of hybrids being grown here in the Northeast in general, especially here in the Finger Lakes. Um, but it has an interesting history in, in France as well. I mean, that's where most of these hybrids hail from originally and are actually still grown to a certain degree. Um, but uh, this one is particularly, that out of all the hybrids that we make, this is my favorite. It has a richer texture and kind of a more sophisticated aromatic profile than most of the other hybrids that we do um, here in the Finger Lakes. Uh, so I tend to get a little bit of a kind of a honey and apricot and a little bit of um, pineapple. And some years it can kind of have a rich kind of honey spice to it as well um, and a wildflower aroma. But uh, yeah, anyway, I hope you guys enjoy this and I'm happy to answer any questions you have about it as well. Thanks, Ben. I, I like this. I like Vignol in general, and this is an especially good one. Um, I know that you've already outlined some of the challenges of farming Vignol, um, but I think I understand there's some benefits as well in terms of its kind of arc, arc, ripe, the timing of certain key windows in its ripening arc. Can you talk a little bit about that? Why Vignol makes sense in the Finger Lakes? Yeah, um, definitely. So Vignol is quite cold hardy. And so we can usually rely on a pretty good crop from Vignol, despite uh, the cold winters that we have. Um, thankfully, we've had pretty mild winters for the most part for uh, for quite a while now. So um, that becomes a little bit uh, a little bit less of a of a concern. But um, you know, as soon as we aren't, as soon as we stop selecting the right uh, the right fruit for the right site, uh, is when the cold winter rolls in and and uh, shocks us back to reality. Um, so the nice thing is we can, we can plant this up a little bit further away from the lake. Um, so cold hardiness is a, is a definitely a big, uh, uh, a big consideration here for this particular variety. Um, Vignol, other, other than that, you know, I, I know that, um, uh, growing hybrids is, is seen as kind of like a, a little bit of a more dramatic approach to, to viticulture, but it's been going on for a long time Like this this varietal was, was bred in 1930. We are, we grow some hybrids here, uh, at Lakewood and, and, uh, purchase some from our partner growers here on Seneca Lake and on Cuca Lake. Um, you know, they were hybridized back in the mid 1800s. Um, so they've been around for quite a while. They're more modern varieties in the sense that they are hybridized between native American, um, <coughs> native European stock, but, uh, they have, they've been making a lot of wine out of these for, for a long time. And, um, I'd say besides the cold hardiness, the Vignol, as far as we have, uh, can tell, and we've been growing it for over 50 years, um, is actually not a very 
easy grape to grow <laughs> otherwise. We have some hybrids that we grow, say Cayuga White, for instance, which is a bit more of a modern hybrid uh, developed at Cornell University that is disease resistant, drought tolerant, cold hardy, crops really well, uh, nice loose, loose clusters, and uh, that's and ripens early. That is an ideal hybrid. <laughs> Vignol, if it didn't taste so good, we would not make it. We would not bother because it's a real pain to grow. Um, so, but you know, priorities for hybridization have changed throughout the decades and and throughout the the different generations of of uh, wine growers that are kind of demanding different things. And right now, we're definitely looking at. Um, obviously cold hardiness is a priority, but disease and pest resistance is big too. How can we, uh, how can we manage the vineyards with as, as little chemical input as possible? How can we, um, manage the vines, uh, in, in the most sustainable way? How can we ensure that we won't have to do a lot of replants because of winter damage? And how can we ensure that, uh, that these crops are going to get nice and ripe each and every year? And so these are, uh, these are considerations that they that they factor in a lot more now than they used to when hybridizing. Um, not to, not to, you know, throw too much shade on JF Ravat. Uh, not that he'll mind, he's been long dead, but, um, you know, these, they, they, at the time, uh, during, during, uh, kind of a big spurt of hybridization back in the late 1800s and early 1900s, they were really just trying to find new things uh, that tasted good. And, um, you know, they, they did find some of those, but they, uh, I think we have a little bit more, um, a lot more money goes into it now, that's for sure. I mean, Cornell University runs a, a large grapevine breeding program, and they put a lot of money and attention into, uh, into finding varieties that, that are more sustainable. And uh, so, and they have a pretty rigorous methodology for that too, that takes decades to, to produce one. So, um, We've we've learned and built on on all of these things from the past, but you know some of these are are uh, are delicious anyway. No, thank you. That's wonderful. I think there's a lot um, to be said in term for hybrids, um, and in fact, you know the one of the biggest pieces is like you said, it's a long history of hybrids in the Finger Lakes, right? The vinifera piece is a relatively new chapter, mm -hmm. uh, and then for those I know we didn't do an overview, but. I think I just want to dwell on something that Ben said that was, you know, they tend to, because it is so cold in the Finger Lakes uh, and the lakes, especially Seneca Lakes, acts actually as a thermal insulator. The vinifera plantings tend to really hug the coastline, which is, you know, obviously a bit limiting from a real estate perspective. So the fact that he said they can kind of grow this up away from the water, you know, it, it provides some flexibility in terms of land management and, um, you know, what you can plant and where. Um so really cool. Um, it feels right to um, to try a hybrid wine or else we wouldn't be getting the entire picture of, of New York State wines, certainly. Um, and I want to thank everybody. It's now two o'clock. Um, so we've hit the hour mark, but I'm hoping Katie will let us take some uh, questions from the attendees and bring everybody back up on screen. Um, are any, any immediate questions jump to mind for uh, myself or for any of the other panelists? mostly just a lot of praise for y'all and your wines. So, so that's exciting. Um, we'll give it a few more minutes. I actually had a question um, for Ben on just talking about how you said, you know, with the hybrids and how they're more focused about being pest and disease resistant. I wondered, are there like new pests and diseases that have come up just in the last couple of years that, you know, have kind of, you know, just popped up or are they mostly just kind of the historical ones that have always been a problem? Oh, I, I wish I could tell you it was just the historical ones. <laughs> um, 
but uh, we are we operate in a global economy and we have um, the, the pests move with the products sometimes. So one thing, for instance, that we're keeping a very close eye on right now is the spotted lantern fly, which has been infesting Pennsylvania for several years now. And so Cornell has a lot of trapping and monitoring stations all over the Finger Lakes so that we can monitor for this pest, which has been seen here and there, but we haven't really seen it take hold here yet. It's kind of just the general uh, consensus is that it's only a matter of time. Um, so that's a that's a recent uh, you know it's a recent example that everybody's thinking about. But um, you know, as in terms of insect pests, that's a bit new for us. We don't really worry too much about insect pests here in the Finger Lakes for the most part. Um, and I, you know, at least I can speak for our farm. I don't, I can't even remember the last time we, we took action against any insect pests, that is to say sprayed for, for insects. Um, it's just not something that, that we really have to worry about too much here in our climate. Um, that said, you know, uh, cool, wet weather during the harvest season can bring on, um, you know, certain fungal and, and uh, mildew and that kind of thing uh, that affects the leaves and the fruit. And so we have to be ever vigilant about that. And, you know, many of these have become more and more resistant to some of the traditional uh, applications, which have been used all around the world for a very long time. Um, so, uh, it, it becomes more difficult to deal with those. So having some varieties that have some built-in natural resistance to those makes a huge, a huge difference. And one of the, the best ways to keep your fruit clean is to have a nice open, open canopy, of course, and allow your fruit to dry off after a, after a rain event. But if your clusters and your berries are really tightly packed together, like Pinot Noir, um, for instance, or Gamay, or let's say Vignol, uh, that's that's not really helping you all that much. Um, and what they've done now is uh, one of the priorities for their grapevine breeding these days is to find varietals with looser clusters so that air can circulate through the cluster and actually dry out the fruit and decrease the the uh, pressure from those pathogens to begin with. So there's a couple examples for you. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Then... There is another, uh, I'm sorry, there's a question in the chat uh, that says, with these varieties like Terral de Go and Legrine, in addition to Tokai, as opposed to known grapes like Chard or Pinot Noir, how much effort goes into educating consumers locally, or do you find that they're open to trying whatever you might be producing? Um, I can I can answer that, and Christopher, I'm sure, you're, sure you'll want to add to it as well. Um, I would say we do have to put in extra effort it, it, locally, if locally means um, in the tasting room, um, there is extra effort put into I, one of the biggest challenges, which is which seems so simple and silly, but one of the biggest challenges with getting um, visitors to the tasting room to try to roll to go grind is that they can't pronounce it. So they don't want to say it and they don't want to be embarrassed. Um, so they oftentimes will not order it for that reason. So we have we have talked to our staff about making sure that they, um, you know, proactively introduce it to um, guests so that, um, you know, they're not intimidated by it. And then we did do, because um, like you said, we have uh, staff here is, who is, you know, some are SOM, some are WSET trained, but there's not much experience with these two varietals. So we did do a little Terral de Go Legrine school um, with Russell before we started selling it. But yeah, I would say um, it is, it, it works both ways. Uh, for some guests, it's a challenge because they're intimidated by it. For other guests, especially, you know, where we are in New York with proximity to the city and, and a lot of our, our guests wanting to try new and interesting things, it helps us because they see something different on uh, the menu and they just automatically want to try it. So it, it does work both ways. Um, in terms of wholesale, it's a little bit different. Uh, what we're seeing in wholesale is we actually, when we introduced Terrell to go Le Grind in 2019, we weren't going to wholesale it because we were we only made about 400 cases of it. Um, but we had uh, accounts and SOMs and buyers actively reach out to us about it because they were looking for something new and different. So I think 
it, uh, it uh, again, it's it's a positive and a negative in wholesale as well. It, it may not, we may not ever sell as much Terrell de Go Le Grind as we sell Cab Franc or Merlot, but there are buyers that are proactively seeking it out from us. Yeah, I would agree with Amy that it, it's true. It works both ways, it's especially at Channing Daughters. People look to us and have for a long time because we grow so many different varieties and make so many different styles. So people are coming looking for, um, again, something that pushes the envelope with us. But, you know, we look at that as an opportunity, too, when people aren't familiar with it. We take education very seriously and have people that have been with us for a long time. And we really like to spend time with people when they come in, if we can. Um, to educate them about the varieties and styles in Long Island and wine in general. And to be perfectly frank, I think that's true with consumers across the board, whether it's Lagrine or Sauvignon Blanc. There's tons of consumers that come in that may know lots about wine, may know some about wine, and may know nothing. So whether it's Lagrine or Tiraldigo or Tokai or Chardonnay, um, you could be in the same boat. <laughs> they could have equally no knowledge about any of those things. Um, then another question went up about Rebola. Yeah, we grow Rebola um, at Channing Daughters and make uh, Rebola Giala and have for, for a while now. We planted it in, in 2007. And I think that was Patricia that asked that question. And she asked a question too at the Pet Nat about it being cloudy. And um, yeah, that goes to the fact that we don't disgorge the wines because we sort of look at that as a method, uh, traditional method process that is one of the steps that takes up a huge amount of time and labor and um, equipment and money. Um, and so Method Ancestral and sort of the style of that sort of um, spoke to us as something that would not be disgorged. I know that's somewhat of a debate within the Method Ancestral and Pet Not World, but for us, um, we like the expressiveness of them not um, being disgorged and having some cloudiness and then having some yeast and tartrate crystals and some leftover stuff. Um, so hopefully I got those questions answered. That's wonderful. Um, thank you, guys. I think we should probably call it, Katie, unless you think we have time for a few more. Oh, I think we can wrap it up. Any follow-up questions, we can always answer after the fact as well. Okay, great. Well, thank you, uh, Katie. Thank you, everybody. Wonderful panelists, beautiful people. Uh, this was great. The wines were fabulous. Thank you so much, and happy Wednesday. Cool. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, panelists. And thanks to you attendees. Um, we have now wrapped our series. And so as I mentioned, uh, you'll get a, a link to the recording. And um, on the YouTube channel, you can see, as Kelly mentioned, all of the previous episodes as well. So if you missed any of those, um, that's where you'll find it. And we'll have some more programming coming to you later this year. So um, you'll we'll be sure to be in touch. So thank you again. Have a great day.